A quick announcement. In a few minutes, we'll be starting, but just so that there's enough seats for everyone, there's a lot of empty seats more towards the front, so if you can uh, squeeze in where you're able, and if you're at the back looking for something, don't be intimidated to come up uh, front, and we'll make room for everyone. If we need to, we'll put out more chairs, but there's still a lot of empty uh, little pieces. We'll start in a few minutes. My name is Donna Scopper, and it is my privilege to be one of the ministers here at Judson Church. Michael Ellick, who many of you know as well, is the other minister, and we are pleased to be able to host this service. Let us pray. In the name of all that is good and true and beautiful, in the name of the ice and the water, in the name of the fire that warms us, in the name of the earth's soil that sustains us, in the name of the great wind of all the spirits that are gathered here, in the name of you, O oh God, whom some call Yahweh and others breath, you whom some call Allah and others call Jesus and others call Christ, you whom some know as energy or force, you who have promised us that Holocaust will end and that holiness will intervene. Come now and bless this gathering, that the words we speak are true and that we honor the life of the man we have loved so much for so long. Amen. You will see in your program that only names are listed. There were so many people who needed to get, that's the sound of the uh, door. People are still coming in. It was an icy day. It's going to be challenging to uh, make sure that all the speakers are here. And some are not here yet, so we may deviate from the program. But I'm simply going to call their names and invite them to come forward uh, at the appointed time. And then we will sing and we will listen and we will speak. All right, let us begin. Roberto. Takahi, uh, Waitiao, greetings relatives. Uh, my name's uh, Roberto Borrero, and it's uh, my honor to be here today with all of you on this uh, celebration day of our friend, brother, uncle, grandfather, and many things, uh, Father Paul Mayer. I was thinking about uh, Father Paul on, on the way here, and I was thinking about his smile and then thinking about how his face changed when uh, we spoke about things like injustice and he kind of got in his warrior pose, you know, and uh, that made me smile. Uh, I was thinking back on some of the conversations that uh, I had the honor to have with him over the years. Um, and, and one thing that, that uh, I recall was, uh, his love of life, his amazement, right, of life itself. And I think that uh, many of us understand this when we're young, you know, when we're children, we're amazed by everything, a flower, a butterfly, and you see that, I know I see it in my children's faces, that you see that they light up, they're, they're amazed by these things that are, that are new. And as we get older, as we change, that, that amazement starts to fade, and we kind of get distracted by everything else going on around. And it's not till later on when we start to see our friends and family making that transition, going to the other side, that we start to realize once again how amazing and blessed we all are just to share this 
time together, this sacred time that we have. It's not too much time. It's like the flash of the firefly, they say. And I was thinking that some people get it, right, as they get older and they see that again and they, and they embrace that amazement and, and they, they live that. And I feel that, that Father Paul had that amazement all the time and uh, that, that made me happy uh, to know that. So this song that I want to sing and share uh, with you uh, in honor of uh, Father Paul and uh, just for all of us who are here and taking, taking the message forward as uh, earth guardians, as he would say. Uh, this song is a song in, in my uh, Taino language, my ancestral language, which is not English or Spanish. Uh, probably the first indigenous language that uh, Columbus heard when he came over to this side of the world uh, when they started the 500 year cycle in 1492. So this song talks about uh, the winds of change and how we look at those winds and how we greet them and with respect and we speak to them. So uh, this is uh, for Father Paul and for all of us. Thank you, relatives, uh, for this time, for being here, and uh, thank you to the family for inviting me here today. Hahom, thank you. It's now my pleasure to introduce uh, Peter, Paul's son, who will speak. As my father would say, welcome brothers and sisters. I won't try to match the man's gift for oratory today, nor recite his compliments, though they were many, but only to stand witness as his son. Although this last year was a difficult one, I cannot be ungrateful. The time we spent together was rich with laughter and music, it was full of love and light. We spent many hours reflecting on our lives together and what obstacles might not have been surmounted. We spoke of redemption and forgiveness, of our gratitude and respect for one another, and for the love and concern he had for my sister Maria and his beloved grandchildren. I had many opportunities to look back on my childhood, now through the lens of a grown man to reassess the challenges and hurdles we faced growing up as a parent now myself. It was with great confidence that I, I was able to reassure him that so many of the values he had tried to teach us 
were now my own. I was able to let him know that I understood how a sense of responsibility extended beyond our immediate family, all of us earth guardians, brothers and sisters. This has been a time when my respect and admiration for my father has been given a new shape and clarity. It's easy to fall into a comfortable narrative about how, of a parent as their lives and tales take on a familiar tone. And as we all know, the tales are many. But what I was reminded of as my father greeted every doctor, nursing aide, hospital janitor with the same sincerity and enthusiasm is that here was a man unique in his openness and with a genuine affection for everyone he met, just as his yoga guided him throughout his life to live with a softened heart. Time and time again, I was reminded of these qualities he embodied throughout his life, his ability to look into people's hearts and identify what was sacred, to deeply understand the struggles of the poor and the underserved, to listen to the wounded and know how to heal, to help carry the weight of others and inspire thoughtful responsibility, to spread the message of leaving the earth a better place than when we found it. These are not ordinary gifts, and this was not an ordinary man. I will only say that he was a wonderful father, a great friend, and I will miss him. Thank you, Peter. Judith Thompson. Hi, everybody. And I want to say, hello, Paul. Nice to have you with us, Paul. Thank you. I knew I would be moved, but I really wasn't anticipating feeling what I'm feeling right now. Um, I took a few notes on our new gadgetry as I was coming down on the train, and I'll refer to some of them probably. Uh, I met Paul in 1982. It was the UN Special Session on Disarmament II. He was the head of the religious task force at the time of the mobilization for survival. And we were putting together something called the International Religious Convocation, which preceded the now historic June 12th rally in Central Park. I'm sure many of you were there and remember the time. But I just want to give you a sense. This was at the Cathedral of St. John the Divine, 10,000 people from 14 different faiths. Uh, the cathedral was packed, followed by a procession down Broadway to Central Park a planting of a tree of life, followed by uh, around-the-clock vigils in front of the United Nations. Because of a small program we did during the religious convocation called the Witness of Children, which brought together children who had been survivors of war or inheritors of that, uh, we spawned a program called Children of War that Paul and I organized together starting in 1984. And I want to give you the setting for this for a moment. It's June 1984, this very small grassroots board of a yet unincorporated organization, the Religious Task Force, said yes to do this project. We had no money. We had two people on our staff. We had no computer. We had no fax machines, because one didn't in those days. Six months later, we had 42 teenagers from about 18 different war zones touring to 50 cities, going into hundreds of high schools, developing solidarity partnerships with US young people, children of war also coming from inner cities, homeless shelters, migrant worker camps in this country, being launched by Archbishop Tutu practically the day after he got the Nobel Peace Prize, being on the front page of the New York Times, a wonderful volunteer staff, many of whom are here today, a wonderful group of dedicated adult activist counselors who worked with young people. I would have to say it was the most glorious 
uh, thing I've ever done in, and it's now been 25 years since that happened and I've done a lot of great stuff as Paul has. But as I was thinking about it, I thought who would you want to have working beside you who would say yes to the impossible continually beside Paul Mayer? Who? You know, we know of this great book called The Audacity of Hope. Well, I would say Paul Mayer was the most audacious human being I ever met. The most audacious person. He saw something, it moved his heart, he said yes to it, and he did it. And there were some who were put out by that. I was from time to time. You know, it's not easy to keep up with an audacious person who's always saying yes. I also had the privilege of, of being in a close, intimate relationship with Paul for five years and living with him during that period of time. And you learn lots of things in that particular path as well. In deference to time, I wanted to share sort of five things that struck me as I was coming down on the train from Boston this morning and thinking about it that I really learned from Paul. One is what I just said, the audacity to dream big and organize big. Uh, and of course, the analysis, the chutzpah, the great organizing skills to do that. But this man, as we all know, was this most remarkable visionary who at the same time understood the, 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 the whole within the parts. So there was the great and the small. Every personal relationship, teaching yoga to elderly people, homeless people in Newark and East Orange, doing the weddings that he did, seeing in every personal relationship that he had with anybody the opportunity to bring forward that belief in a just and compassionate world everywhere he went. Three, fear and or courage in the face of fear. And I'm not just talking about political situations, and I'm not just talking about organizing. What we walked through as a, in, in our own relationship, what I saw him walk through with anybody who uh, needed to, felt they needed to take him on with something, he sat through the fierceness of, of conversations and of deep plummeting into doubts like no one I ever saw. And always, you always knew with Paul the bottom line. He would be there, he would confront it, he would stay clear, and he would go through it to a loving place. I never saw him fail with that. His spiritual thirst was something that he and I um, shared a great deal about. And watching him walk a path of peaks and valleys, you know, the valleys of doubts, the lack of clarity from time to time of feeling forsaken or not, but the, the absolute fierceness of his passion for a communion with a God that uh, whose heart he was exemplifying. I'm sure some of you saw that great movie, Chariots of Fire, where there's a runner who says, when I run, I feel God's pleasure. Well, when you're with Paul and he was grounded in that thirst, you got a sense that you felt God's desire for the beloved community through him, through the way he spoke with his life. And finally, as everyone will testify to his just tremendous love for the world, his desire for the beloved community uh, was unlike anybody I had ever met. Through thick and thin, uh, that's how his heart was guided. I, I wrote him a letter. I'm just gonna read the last part of it. Before he died, uh, I was not able to see him. But because I know he's with us now, I wanna share this. You have experienced the most remarkable life, dear Paul, so filled with challenge and transcendence. You have walked through many fires and carried the flames of possibility for countless others. Truly you are one of the greatest wounded healers of all times and have walked so hard on behalf of love and compassion and justice in this world. It has always been humbling to witness the constancy with which you have attended to the wounds of this world, Paul. With such humility and compassion, your heart is precious to this planet. I wish for you now the joyfulness, the peacefulness of Christ's loving embrace, which surrounds you now and always. 
I wish for you now the joy of realizing that your legacy is written into the future of humanity and of this planet through the gratitude of unborn generations that will benefit from your tireless love, fierce vision, and unyielding passion to build the beloved community and protect our Mother Earth. I wish for you now ease of breath and body and the deep experience of that which is true for you, dear Paul, as said by Jesus, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Father Toll. Thank you. Hello. I fear I'm more loquacious than most speakers here. I hope that didn't go over too much time. And I also hope that, and Peter's asking me to speak, that I speak of things that he wanted me from my experience to say. So I thought of the, my image of Paul and lessons I learned from him, but I'd like to start by saying something that happened to me in the beginning of December. I was coming from an AIDS remembrance, uh, the 25th anniversary of the AIDS crisis, and as I left the church, I met on the street on Fifth Avenue and 15th Street, uh, a beautiful Lubavitcher boy, simple, open, eager to talk, as the Lubavitchers are. And uh, when he found out I wasn't a Jew, but I was a Christian, in all the simplicity of his zeal, he says, well then, take my last candle, or take, take my, my study of uh, my study of Hanukkah. There was a sweetness and openness about him. It made me think of Jesus in the temple going about his father's business. On my way home, dumb Christian that I am, I thought to myself, what would this kid be like if he ever found Jesus? <laughs> Apologies, Jerry. But just as quickly, I could hear Jesus say, don't ask that question. I'm perfectly content with him, just as he is. The boy may already have Jesus in his bones more deeply and naturally than most of us Christians. For Martin Buber wrote of Jesus, from my youth onwards, I have found in Jesus my great brother. I'm more than ever certain that a great place belongs to him in the history of Jewish faith and that this place cannot be described by any of the usual categories. So we come to Paul Mayer. New York Times described Paul as having lived, quote, a life of extravagant disregard for conventions. <laughs> Do you know it seemed that it's truer to say that Paul could not abide conventions or categories that might distance him or separate him from any other human being. I first met him in the company of Dan Berrigan in the early 80s. Before I came to love him as a friend, I wasn't ready to deal with the puzzle and the challenge that he was to me. Should have been enough for me that he was Dan's dear friend, but I had my categories and I needed conversion. Born Jewish, Christian at 16, monk, priest, loving husband to Naomi, father of Peter and Maria, freelance thorn in the side of authority. What, what was I to make of him? Peter was with him that day, maybe 13 years of age, learning his father's business, reading Karl Marx for beginners. <laughs> what would he become, I said. I saw him encouraging Peter's curiosity with wonder. And Paul seemed to have utter confidence in his son's own search for truth and wisdom, and in Maria's admiration and courage for her courage and her inner strength. But what, what broke through for me that first meeting and through all the years that followed was the absolute peaceableness 
about the man, his human tenderness and affection, the gentle way he spoke with everyone, the companion that he wanted to be, even to me, whom he had never met. He had become content with just the two commandments, love of God and love of neighbor. So far as I could see, there was never a disparaging of traditions in Paul. Rather, in deference to Rabbi Saperstein and Rappaport, he knew the truest of Jewish traditions, that to be religious meant to build the human community and assume personal responsibility for it. His being found in Christ only added strength to his inbred need to go out into the world with Jesus and decide not to be a guilty bystander. So he did, we know, all over the world, from San Miguelito, where the poor were given their saying in the base community movement, solidarity in Selma causing trouble in Moscow, reporting from North Vietnam bringing comfort to East Orange, and in these last years, camping in Zuccotti Park. There too, Paul left his heart and example as a comrade to the younger generation he so admired and believed in. His struggle for justice, as I saw, was always a need and longing to be with those who had no voice and with anyone who shared his loving concern for them. This was the effective tone to what is stereotypically called his, quote, activism. From behind the fence, he would talk to the police who were mustering to arrest him and his friends. He always tried to reach their hearts, even as they stared straight ahead as they were taught, trying not to listen to the gospel. And one final correction. The Times obituary spoke of Paul Mayer as an ex-priest If what Buber saw is true, that only through our deeds, rooted in freedom, can we make God real. Paul saw this, quote, activism as making God real and the very heart of what it is to be a Catholic priest, even if in its most unconventional way. He took seriously what he was told on the day of his ordination. You are a priest forever. I leave Melchizedek out in the moment, but there's a story behind that. He believed this at his core and would insist that we are all such priests, if only we knew ourselves. And the last tender image I have of Paul was at a Eucharist the death of our beloved friend Bob Keck, who died of cancer himself last March. Now enfeebled by his own advancing cancer, he was sitting in the front row his arm draped around the shoulder of, <laughs> of Dan Berrigan uh, the two of them alone, companions in the struggle for the last 50 years. And I thought how that arm, if it could, would have gathered in all the world's children, just as Jesus wanted to do. Now it's my pleasure to introduce Eve Silber, who is going to sing with us and with Peter. I should just say that my father made me practice. <laughs> so.
I was asked um, by a few people today to talk about the book. Um, Paul finished his book this summer. It's called Wrestling with Angels, a spiritual memoir of a political life. He did some major cuts that were painful and in some final touches. And um, I guess I've been asked to say, you know, we are in, in the process and in, in some dialogue with publishers and have various directions to go. If you want to help with getting this book out to everybody in the world, let me know. And also there's a sign-up sheet on the back table for a reading group that Pam Craft is organizing um, to get together to read his book at her loft. The chorus for this song is in your program. We hope you will sing along when you're ready. We're going to do the chorus twice at the end just to make sure. Because happiness 
is a moment's glass to spin inside the circle's charm and I walked my line to have my chance to lay my head on your blessing Gail Walker. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, to the immediate and extended uh, family of Paul Mayer um, and our dear friends, uh, thanks for this opportunity to share some of my fond memories of our dear friend and brother, Father Paul Mayer. Like so many others here, I met Paul through the struggle for social justice. Uh, I ran into Paul at uh, way too many demonstrations or protests or celebrations of um, what's right and good uh, to mention, to count. Uh, but I first met Paul in 1992 uh, during the first U.S. Cuba Friendshipment Caravan organized by IFCO, the Interreligious Foundation for Community Organization, under the leadership of my late father, uh, the late Reverend Lucius Walker, Jr. Um, he and um, Paul were really kindred spirits in so many ways. But the Friendshipment Caravans were an act of nonviolent civil disobedience aimed at pressuring the U.S. government to reverse the enforcement of its immoral and unjust and brutal mean-spirited economic blockade against Cuba. And Paul was one of 100 caravanistas who participated during the first caravan, carrying tons of simple humanitarian aid, uh, like powdered milk, medicines, Bibles, bicycles, and school supplies to Cuba. The government had never before seen such a massive direct grassroots challenge to the blockade. Uh, so it was no wonder that uh, Paul would be there uh, on the front lines in that struggle. Uh, I'll never forget the image um, of seeing uh, CNN cameras filming U.S. Treasury officials assaulting Paul as he carried uh, a Bible in each hand, literally a Bible in each arm. Uh, he bravely held on to them as these officials attempted to violently snatch the Bibles from him. And it was the broad-based uh, emergency response network that IFCO had organized. Uh, many of you, I'm sure, in this room uh, participated in uh, making calls to Washington, D.C. Uh, to um, 
demand that the caravan be let go to, 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 uh, to go on to Cuba. Um, the combination of that CNN uh, coverage uh, and that emergency response network prompted thousands to call Washington and the pressure was felt and the government did relent and the caravan crossed. And Paul was with us in Cuba. There's a picture back uh, on the wall um, that brought a smile to my face uh, of him and uh, Fidel Castro. It was during that trip. Um, he traveled with us to Cuba and was there when we presented the Bibles that he carried uh, to then Cuban President Fidel Castro. And the president described the heroic gesture of Paul and the other caravanistas as writing a new page in the Bible. He said the Bible has not been fully written yet and that uh, the efforts that had been made were really uh, contributing to the writing of today's Bible the modern Bible. Uh, I learned of Paul's passing on the eve of my last trip to Cuba and shared the news with our Cuban friends when I arrived there who remembered his involvement with the early caravans and expressed deep sympathy uh, to Paul's family and close friends and those in the struggle for justice who knew and worked so closely with him over the decades. Paul, much like my dad, was a liberation theologian who didn't shy away from challenges, including confrontations with the church hierarchy. Paul told uh, the writer Alan Levine, uh, church leaders didn't always approve of me, my theology, and my politics. I, I would say I was marching to a different drummer. They thought it was Che Guevara, Elvis Presley, or Martin Luther. I thought it was Jesus, he said. And I agree. Paul was such a kind and gentle soul and he had the most wonderful smile. Anybody who knew Paul, you knew that great smile that he had. His profound commitment to peace with justice was undying and for those of us who were blessed to know him, he will always be a shining light. One of the last times I saw Paul was at a tribute for a political prisoner, Leonard Peltier at the Beacon Theater. We were online at the box office waiting to retrieve our tickets when two people began to argue about who was next. And you won't be surprised to know that it was Paul in that quiet yet strong way that he had who simply said, it really doesn't matter who goes next. We will all get in. We will all be able to pay tribute to Leonard and to show our support. And that is really the most important thing. And as the two people who were squabbling hung their heads in shame, I looked at Paul and said, Blessed be the peacemaker. <laughs> and he looked at me and with that twinkle in his eye, you know, that he had, he winked and shared that wonderful smile of his. It's a, last, a lasting uh, image that I'll, I have of Paul. While he's no longer with us in flesh, his spirit lives on in all who knew him. He was a wonderful teacher, mentor, spiritual activist, whose commitment to global peace, nonviolent social change, environmental justice, health, and healing is a gift that he continues to give. Thank you, Paul. Please join me in acknowledging his undying spirit. Paul Mayer, presente. Paul Mayer. Presente. Paul Mayer. Presente. Thank you. How many of you here have been arrested with Paul Mayer? Okay. Of that number, how many have in prison been taught yoga by Paul Mayer? <laughs> yoga class in the prison, right? A singular experience I'm honored to have had. One time I was in jail with Paul Mayer and uh, the uh, Irish cop starts asking basically for confession. He's giving uh, confession, or Paul's giving confession to the cop through the bars. And it led to the conversation uh, between the rest of us who were there with him, just regular Joes with Paul, we're with Paul, that, uh, you know, who was the captive and who was the liberated. So 
There's a lot of friends of Paul's who can't be here today. There's a lot of people from everywhere who couldn't be here today. Uh, one was Phil Lawson, who um, was all set to arrive and sort of represent the Council of Elders, which uh, Paul was a part. Uh, Phil is sick. He's had to stay home in Oakland. He asked me to read uh, this letter from Phil. Friends, shalom, peace, shalom. I am sorry I cannot be there with all of you. Paul Mayer, my good friend, nothing could pull me away other than this sickness. My hope had been to be present both for myself and on behalf of the council. As Paul and I go back over 50 years, not attending today hits me hard. The Hebrew text, chapter 12, verse 1, has been with me since his passing. Therefore, surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin that clings so closely and run with perseverance that race that is set before us. With with Elder Paul as our witness, running the race for justice, freedom and beloved community is that much more possible today in 2014 than it ever has been before. For Elder Paul was never just a spectator of the race. He was an active participant, deeply engaged and responsible. And thus, heaven has gained an extra added attraction in that cloud that hovers so close to us all. Elder Paul also recognized that we must run the race that is set before us. We do not get to choose the dangers and challenges of our time. So although he did not choose to run the race that he did, he did not hesitate to run with deep commitment and perseverance and archetypal unwavering integrity. Remind members of the community gathered there today that there is still much excess baggage and sin of privilege that we must set aside so that that integrity and wholeness of our race will speak for us as it once upon a time did for Elder Rosa, Elder Martin, Elder Nelson, and Elder Paul. The race continues. Phil Lawson. I just want to add my uh, brief little note at the end of that. A lot of you here have not known, uh, not known Paul for 50 years. You've probably only known him for three. A lot of us got to know him uh, personally through Occupy Wall Street. And if you did, you know that he led the charge. He hopped over fences. <laughs> he did things the rest of us couldn't do. He could look down police officers and just people would magically just smile and stop whatever they were doing. And so um, it's already been said here, I'm sure it'll be said again, that he was so invested in the youth. He was so deeply invested, not just in showing the example, but teaching the example. And I, for one, am eternally grateful for his life and his gift. I know I speak for so many people here. He showed us what real transformation is, not just having right politics, but a certain kind of transformation of the heart that made everything he did some kind of a radical act of compassion in a world of curtness and poor manners. So thank you, Paul. I feel his presence as I know all of you do. Whenever we look at each other in kindness, whenever we make real community, and I'll just end by saying, praise God that we are still being delivered such full embodiments of the gospel. Thank you, amen. Uh, Rabbi Marsha Rappaport. We meet here today on holy ground. This place where we meet each other, where love and memory moves among us. Our need for each other is strong. An invitation to celebrate Paul Mayer's life. As we take on each other's words of celebration of Paul's life, our separate selves disappear and we become sacred tribe and community. Today we meet on holy ground. Rabbi Joshua Heschel said, a religious person is one who holds God and humanity in the same thought, at the same time, at all times, who suffers at the harm done to others, 
whose greatest passion is compassion, whose greatest strength is love and defiance of the sphere. These words have described our Paul Mayer. Paul was an activist. The world has forgotten what is sacred. And to me, activist is a sacred word. It is a word that speaks to the life and the hope of the people. I believe we meet God in the streets, in the faces and the voices and the vision of the people. In the streets, we hear voices that speak for us and with us. We call out to each other, and we hear, and we will be heard. Words are energy, and that enter into our very bodies and give strength and continue, as we continue to say no, no to the wars to make, that make our children murderers, no to the murdering of other people's children, no to the starving children that are starved out of existence, no to genetically modified food and the corporations that poison our water and our food supply. And we say yes to our connection to each other in our places of protest in the streets. And we, and we must be everyone, the connection, the lightning that topples the tower. Sisters and brothers, we give birth to each other in the streets. We transform and strengthen each other and ourselves in the streets. What makes us most human is what makes us divine. And Paul was where you could find, the streets were where you could find Paul Mayer. The first time I saw Paul, he was sitting in the back of a Lincoln Town car in East Hampton. I was meeting him. We were going to, performing a wedding together. And I thought to myself, oh, this is such a quiet gentleman. Do not talk politics, Marsha, do not talk politics. <laughs> but I found out very quickly Paul was very gentle, but a gentle, fierce warrior. His ministry was among the people, from raiding a draft office in Catonsville, from being the head of the defense team of the Harrison Seven, and raising money for the orphans of war, fighting for the environment, and climbing a seven-foot wall at an Occupy Wall Street demonstration. And he was not only there for the actions in the street, he was there for his children, Maria and Paul, and for his grandchildren, who he loved so much and spoke with the, such deep love and devotion. And I'm sure Paul had faults, because it's wonderful, he, but the only thing I could think of was car, Paul had the messiest car I ever saw in my life. <laughs> it would take us five minutes to move over the leaflets and the pamphlets, and the, it was, that's the only thing I can say about Paul, and I'm sure you've all seen his car. And so, but his body got tired and his soul longed to fly home and be free. God is my shepherd, I shall not want. Giving me repose in green meadows, lending, leading me before the still waters, my spirit is revived. I am guarded on the right path, for that is God's essence. My spirit lives with the source that sustains me. And though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no harm. My spirit lives, I am comforted, is prepared a banquet before me, and my head is anointed with oil. My cup floweth over. Surely goodness and kindness will follow me here and continue to be my portion. And I shall dwell in the house of Adonai forever. And I'm gonna sing in Hebrew, chant in Hebrew, Though I walk through this shadow of the valley of death. Gam ki elach begets al malvet lo ira ra ra ra. Gam ki elach begets al malvet. Lo ira ra ra ra, lo ira ra lo ira ra ki atai madi, lo ira ra lo ira ra ki atai madi.
In the Midrash, there is a story, there's a story about a man named Yankel. Yankel was on his deathbed, and he called his rabbi in. Rabbi, he said, I am not afraid to die, but I am afraid that God will ask me, why was I more, not, more like more than Abraham, or Moses, or like Aaron in the Bible? Why was I not more like them? I know God will ask me that, oh, Yankel said the rabbi. God will not ask you why you are not like Abraham or Moses or Aaron, but God will ask you, were you the best Yankel you could be? And so, sleep well and peaceful, our gentle warrior. It was a long way from Frankfurt, Germany, where the Nazis expelled you from school for being a Jew, to climbing the seven-foot wall and Occupy Wall Street. You were the best Paul that you could be. All right, I think we need a stretch break. I knew it was going to happen. There's just too many good things to say about Paul. So will all who are grateful for Paul's life among us please stand up <laughs> and raise your right hand. All right, way to go. You may be seated. Our next speaker is Danny. Where are you? <laughs> and you can stretch some more. All right. And will somebody let me know if Rabbi Saperstein is here? But come on up, Dan. <clears throat> I woke up in the middle of the night <clears throat> on November 7th, 2013 after having seen the war photography exhibit at the Brooklyn Museum. I wrote about that experience in my journal and all the emotions that it triggered in me. And then I reflected on our visit with Paul the night before. The night before last in East Orange with Paul. Dear Paul, who spent his life calmly railing against the aforementioned societal sickness, who saw the good in people and bestowed blessings. Paul, my friend. Paul, who presented a simplicity, an earthiness, a spaciousness, a spaciousness, I wrote a spaciness, <laughs> which is more to the point, a sense of humor and irony, a humility, even as he earned such prominence and respect amongst the progressive people he perpetually engaged with. He was an enigma, is an enigma, with a boundless belief in the good triumphing over evil, in the fight to make that happen, and in the occult forces that will help make it happen. The position of the stars and planets the advice of mediums, the writings of ancient Egyptians, and the wisdom of Native Americans. Paul, a Jewish Holocaust escapee, a Benedictine monk, a yogi, a Catholic priest, an alternative treatment cancer patient putting on Svillin and davening in the hospital, a cat lover, a bringer together of couples, of high school students from opposite sides of conflicts, of lovers from diverse religions and backgrounds, and in 1982, of himself, a quirky, funny, rabble-rousing, sagacious, hemp-smoking, Berlin-born, enigmatic character with a 26-year-old from the Bronx. Or perhaps we were just reuniting from past lifetimes together. I will miss him until the next go round.
Connie Hogarth. There you are. Yes. Hi. Uh, I was reminded when I expected Rabbi Saperstein to say Kaddish for Paul that just three years ago, Paul said Kaddish at my soulmate, wonderful husband, Art Camel's memorial. Art and Paul were such close brothers to a fault. Both died of the same malady, the same type of brain cancer they shared. Art and Paul and I were close comrades, friends, personal and political, for four decades. And that's why Art is here and Paul is here with us, for me. We shared so many bonds of friends like Dan Berrigan, Father Michael Lapsley of South Africa, Jack O'Dell, who's now in Vancouver. But those who are here, I want to mention our comrades Leslie Kagan, Joanne Sheehan, Dave McReynolds, Michael Myerson, and in spirit, the late Norma Becker, Carl Bissinger, and Ralph DeGier, all of whom we worked so closely together with, and so many hundreds more. Paul and I shared many of our hopes and dreams, our sorrows and our joys. Like days on Cape Cod with his, at the time, 16-year-old daughter Maria, when uh, she was just a teenager then, and nights at our home in Beacon, overlooking the Hudson River, which Paul loved so much, learning some of the key Iyengar co uh, yoga poses from our, uh, we, as newcomers, uh, from his expert yoga experiences and teachings, as so many of you know, and his love for Mary Dunn, he shared with my husband, who is a great, great yoga teacher. <clears throat> Dinners together, holidays, shared times with our neighbor Pete Seeger, and the June days when Paul would take some of his grandchildren to the Clearwater Revival in Croton, and we spent that time with him and the kids, and so much more. Actually, Paul's and my own life these four decades have not only been on parallel tracks, but have been intertwined through our work for peace all through the 80s, starting with plowshares, mobilization for survival. Some of the folks I mentioned were very active with us in mobilization for survival. In calling for nuclear disarmament and ending nuclear power, calling for new priorities from what would have been a peace budget, never came through, and always social justice and struggling mightily against racism. And with the Friends at War Resisters League and Friends Movement and the Catholic Left, we shared the organizing of many demonstrations, like many of you, and civil disobedience actions, especially, as was mentioned by Judith, the special sessions on disarmament at the UN. And Paul was the primary organizer of the religious task force in those efforts. During the campaigns in 1984 and 1988 of Reverend Jesse Jackson, who ran for president, as you know, I, as a board member of the National Rainbow Coalition, and Paul, and I'm not sure if he's here, Reverend John Collins, who is planning to be here, the two of them played a major and critical role in organizing the Rainbow People of Faith for justice and peace and for Jesse. They're committed to Jesse, too. When we started 15 years ago, the Connie Hogarth Center for Social Action at Manhattanville College, Paul was the first to say, I want to be on the board. And he was until, until now. Together then with Ted Glick and Tom Stokes, who is here, and with the inspiration of Ross Gelbspan, I don't believe he's here, an environmental writer and researcher, we formed the much needed Climate Crisis Coalition. 
10 years ago, dedicated to teaching and organizing on what is now the crisis of our planet and trying to broaden the base of what was perceived as a white middle class movement to involve ordinary working class people and labor and people of color. And we now acknowledge, we all acknowledge that this is, these are the most, the people first and most affected by global warming. And as you will hear shortly from Ted Glick, this was Paul's primary passion as mover and shaker in these last 10 years, to save this precious planet from the crisis we're experiencing now, and finally seeing it as a global focus. He was everywhere during Wall, uh, Occupy Wall Street, you've heard that. Paul's work in organizing people of faith was in everything he loved and cared about, and he carried that passion and generosity of his spirit in a combination so unique, so beautiful. He was truly a man for all seasons and the rarest of birds. Paul exuded a gentleness and lovingness and hopefulness, we've been hearing about that all day, right through to his very last days. And it's most difficult, I guess, for most of us to imagine that he's gone. His smile, his voice, his quiet brilliance, ever with those of us who loved him. And I know we number many, many, many hundreds. His voice and his persistent, passionate message linger. His memorial simply must be published. His mo I'm sorry, his memoirs simply must be published for all to know and learn from him now that he's gone. Appropriate for Paul is a poem that he wrote, appropriate for him is a poem that he wrote for our mutual comrade, Margaret Eberly, who died in 2009. She was a passionate activist based at Westpac about many things, but especially Central, Central American struggles and Cuba in particular. I have changed the her to him as I read his poem. No cause too small, no obstacle too great for this son of militant Athena. He lived like, life like a flame, unsparing of himself, always burning more brightly. Neither age nor infirmity extinguished his passion for the dream, a world where justice belonged even to the smallest, where peace conquered the mailed fist, where the earth would be mother, not plunderer. We will not often see his like again, this servant of the people, this great soul, Mahatma. Once again, as Gail said to Paul, presente, presente, presente. And uh, now Ted will speak, then we'll have the song by Emma's Revolution, then Bishop Packard will speak, and we'll conclude with the Kaddish led by Rabbi Saperstein. One of the people who is with us today is Reverend Herbert Daughtry from House of the Lord Church, who I've asked to come forward to say a couple of words to us. Reverend Daughtry. Ted, thank you. Just a few words. Connie, how you doing? Uh, you know, somebody wrote somewhere, you probably know where better than I. What are the worst of woes that wait on age? What stamps the wrinkle deepest in the brow? To view loved ones blotted from life's page and to be alone as I am now. How true that is, I found as I age having reached 83 now, and this week has been an occasion where so many that I have known have gone the way of all flesh. 
I was just at the funeral of Nelson Mandela at the gravesite. I will leave here and go to a friend, John Branch, uh, funeral. Well, I knew Paul for many years. Connie has mentioned the Rainbow Coalition, uh, June 12th, uh, mobilization against the various wars, social justice, you mention it. He had a, a rare distinction of being able to not be what he fought against. I say that is rare. So often those of us who are in this struggle, we find ourselves becoming strangely like the forces we fight. But he sustained a peace, a deep, profound peace that radiated itself wherever he was, whether in the jail cell, whether walking the street, whether challenging some opposition, uh, he sustained this profound peace. But you never got the sense that it was a peace that was fragile, weak, cowardly. You, he might have reached that ideal that Dr. Martin Luther King spoke of having a, a tender heart and a tough mind. So we'll miss him. Uh, there is a, a leader in our uh, tradition, Marcus Garvey, who once said, look for me in the whirlwind. So I say, Paul is not dead, really, let's, uh, but let us look for him in the whirlwind of social change as we walk the streets of New York and across the world fighting forces that oppress. Uh, let us look for him as he moved to and fro. Let us look for him in the classrooms and at the seats of power, speaking truth to power. Let us look for him there. I think i conclude with the uh, quote from the Apostle Paul. The time has come for me to be offered. I fought a good fight. I finished my course and I've kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, that righteous judge, shall give me at that day. Paul fought a good fight. The Greek mythology is a story I like is, you know, after the Trojan War and, and Hector had been killed and Achilles had been killed and then this voice came on in a narration that says, if anybody should ever write my story, let them say that I walked with giants. Let them say that I lived in the time of Homer and Achilles. Well, if anybody should ever write my story, let them say that I walked with giants, that I lived in the time of Nelson Mandela. I lived in the time of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. I lived in the time of Paul Mayer. I'd like to begin my remarks with reading a paragraph that was sent to me by Holly Near, who wanted to be here today but was not able to make it happen. This is what she sent to me. Paul came to hear me sing last fall at the Rubin Museum. It warmed my heart just to know he was in the audience and then to greet him after the concert. It was like having a vibrant calendar of the last 45 years of my life in the peace and justice movement rolled out before me. I don't remember a time when Paul wasn't there. Although I'm out in California, I send my love cross country to be with all of you who knew and love Paul. Um, I met Paul in 1970 while on trial in Rochester, New York as part of the Catholic left for a nonviolent raid on a federal building to destroy selective service draft files. We worked together in the early 70s as part of the People's Coalition for Peace and Justice. And in 1979, he presided over the marriage ceremony that united me with Jane Califf, my soulmate for the last 35 years. But it is over the last 10 years that we've worked most closely together. <clears throat> 
In late 2003, we discovered that we had both come to the same point of view regarding the urgency of the climate crisis, the deepening climate crisis. And in early 2004, right here at Judson Church, with Connie, Connie Hogarth and others, founded the Climate Crisis Coalition, which is still active today under the able and dedicated leadership of Tom Stokes. And for the last two and a half years, Paul and I have worked closely together as co-founders and leaders of Interfaith Moral Action on Climate, which I'm sure Paul would want me to say is organizing its second annual Interfaith Service on January 15th, Martin Luther King Jr.'s 85th birthday, in front of the American Petroleum Institute and the White House in DC, calling for strong leadership from religious and political leaders on this urgent crisis. And there is also an action that day here in New York City at the Canadian Consulate at 6th Avenue and 49th Street. And there's literature in the back about both of these actions. Paul's concern with an activism in defense of our wounded natural environment went back over 20 years that I know of. He attended the 1992 Earth Summit in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil and considered himself, as others have mentioned today, an Earth Guardian. As he explained in an interview a couple of years ago, quote, that's been my priority since having worked on peace and justice issues all my life. I feel that the climate issue is now of the greatest importance, the issue that incorporates all other issues and we must make our priority. In this work to prevent the catastrophic disruption of human society and the ecosystems we and all life forms depend upon, Paul was a warrior. He gave of himself, of his time, his energies, his emotions and his very limited resources, financial resources, to build the strongest possible movement in defense of the earth. He worked to build a movement that was inclusive and broadly based, but also truth-telling and willing to risk arrest. He helps us all, helped us all to never forget that it is the least of these, those of low income, predominantly people of color, who are least responsible for the fossil fuel burning and deforestation that are the primary drivers of climate change, but who are the most impacted by the more damaging storms, floods, droughts, fires, and sea level rise we are seeing as the climate is disrupted. He was very clear that it is the fossil fuel industry, the oil, coal, and gas companies whose power over our government and economy must be broken if we are get to a world powered by the wind, the sun, the currents and tides, and the earth's inner heat, and to a world of justice and peace. My concluding words are different than I had planned because as I, walk <clears throat> as I walked out of my house this morning, taking things to our car to come in from New Jersey. This was right, right before we were about to leave. I heard um, loud honking. Ge I heard geese honking up in the air, up in the sky. And this is not unusual where I live. We live uh, in, a, in a house in, in Bloomfield, New Jersey, and there's a small city pond behind us. And there's geese that are there all year long. But this was very loud. It was very loud. I looked up and I see at least 100, maybe 150 geese flying in V formations over me. And um, as they do, I've seen them in lesser numbers, they, they came over and they, they came around and I saw them as they came down towards landing in the pond. And I couldn't help but think that this was a sign. I don't know what kind of a sign, maybe a sign that people should listen to what I have said about the importance of protecting nature. Maybe it's a sign that Paul was sending. Maybe it's a sign of something else. But I felt it was something I did want to share. Uh, it definitely meant something to me. I know Paul's life meant a great deal to, to all of us and to many other people. And Paul also, I say to you, thank you. Paul Mayer, Presente.
I'm Pat Humphreys. I'm Sandy O. Or we'd, I'd usually say, I'm Emma. I'm the revolution. <laughs> <laughs> Sandy and I didn't have the pleasure of, of knowing Paul personally, but we got the call from, from two friends, both Connie Hogarth and Ted Glick, said, you know, our, our dear friend Paul Mayer has passed. We loved him so much. Would you please come sing? And it was that kind of love, that kind of love of justice, that kind of love of the beloved community that the Reverend mentioned that brought us to this work to begin with, that kind of quiet yet focused clearing of the path that made the way clear for following in the footsteps of so many incredible people, many of you still doing this work, sitting in this room, who've been mentors and have been an inspiration to us. So we really wanted to be here um, to share in that love that you all have for Paul and that we have for one another. And, um, and also see your faces again, so many of you, that we only see over a couple of times a year. Sorry. Just to show our gratefulness as well, for all because all of the issues that we heard the, about that you all worked with Paul with for all of these years, we benefit from that work. We, that's the work that we care about, and we are grateful to all of you, and um, always great to see you all inside instead of just outside where it's cold. <laughs> We've been at many, we were at many of those events that, uh, that Paul was at as well. You know, he just, we didn't end up uh, crossing paths, but we certainly felt his, president, his presence. Montgomery and in Selma and the streets of Birmingham people sent a message to the leaders of the land we have fought and we have suffered we know the wrong from right we are family we are neighbors we are black and we are white here I go bound for freedom may my truth take the lead not the preacher not the congress not the millionaire but me I will organize for justice I will raise my voice in song Then our children will be free to lead the world and carry on From a cell in Pennsylvania No longer on death row For me I have the courage to expose the evil show Courtroom to the boardroom in the television's glare. How the greedy live off poor and hungry people everywhere. Here I go, bound for freedom. May my truth take the lead. Not the preacher, not the Congress, not the millionaire, but me. I will organize for justice. I will raise my voice in song. And our children will be free to leave the world and carry on. Here I go. Though I'm standing on my own, I remember those before me. And I know I'm not alone. I will organize for justice. I will raise my voice and song. And our children will be free to leave the world and carry on. From the streets of New York City, across the ocean and beyond, people from all nations create a common bond with our conscience as our weapon. We 
are witness to the fall. We are simple, we are brilliant, we are one and we are all. Your I go bound for freedom, may my truth take the lead. Not the preacher, not the congress, not the millionaire, but me. I will organize for justice. I will raise my voice in song. And our children will be free to leave the world and carry on. Here I go. Though I'm standing on my own, I remember those before me. And I know I'm not alone. I will organize for justice. I will raise my voice in song. And our children will be free to leave the world and carry on. Bishop Packard. I offer this as a closing prayer as we prepare to be with the rabbi in Kaddish. Let us pray. O oh, wondrous God, in the Lakota language, Ian Oyas Nikotopi, as we give thanks for Paul Mayer, who helped us see the fullness of your mystery. We are grateful for guiding his steps to forbidden places of witness for justice in segregated Selma, bombed out Vietnamese villages, Cuban hospitals, even lately Duarte Park, and so many other places. For allowing him a ferocious prophecy, for in the words of the Shunammite woman of Elisha, he who often comes our way is a holy man of God. This holy man, Paul, came our way with mercy and the expectation for graced fairness. He came our way for justice, the sweetest presence among the arrested, a composed yogi radiating peace. Song followed him behind bars. Prison guard and prisoner were loved in equal measure. We thank you for his walk with the baptized, showing us Christ's revelation that we have been adopted by a loving God as daughters and sons. Who among us hasn't felt Paul's gentle and reliable caring? We can even feel now his soulful companionship, his hand upon ours. His priesthood blessed us. Great enlivening spirit, Paul was on loan to us long enough to arouse new wonder in an illumined world where all things are bathed in light. Indeed, he sat in the sacred circle calling deer, salmon, and owl brother and sister. No wonder he scolded us for spoiling your creation. By his enlistment, we stand in defense of a fragile and nurturing world. We call on the four winds of spirit to guide us in this moment. Those winds blew through Paul's life, animating, sustaining, and gifting him with wise eyes to see truth. We open doors to this place now and let the winds blow a chill breeze for certain, but a reminder of the work he left for us to do, warm the world with loving help and support. Always outgoing, always ongoing. His rhythm never to stop finding and caring will present ever anew to us in the days yet to be. 
And when it does, we will feel the warmth of Father Paul's smile again as we choose to act. A mere thank you, O oh God, for this human, wonderful life is a refrain we will repeat and repeat and repeat. We offer this in your blessed name. Amen. Word of context for the Kaddish prayer that so fittingly closes this remarkable gathering. In the 43 years that Paul and I worked together after Dan Berrigan had first introduced us, did you ever say no to Paul? <laughs> David, we're going to Japan to speak at the Religions for Peace Conference. David, I would arrange something for the NATO War College. David, you gotta come to Cuba. David, you gotta do this, you've gotta do that. And you just got swept up with his yes with his yes to life, his yes to justice. But through it all, in all the times we traveled together and we worked together, the thread of his Jewishness, his Jewishness was part and parcel of who he was. One thread in that majestic tapestry of diverse threads that made up our dear friend. But it was an important one for him a Holocaust refugee, it helped sharpen his identification with victims everywhere. Somebody who saw the prophetic call as central to what God calls of us. It was a central expression of his life that he felt as comfortable in Jewish as he did in Christian terms to lift up God's call for a world for justice for all. And he was particularly in our discussions on theology, particularly entranced with this theme of Jewish theology that argues that when God created the universe, God chose to leave one part of creation undone, the creation of a world of justice and peace. And that God ennobled humanity, raised us above mere biological existence and gave to our lives meaning and destiny and purpose, entrusted in our sacred text a blueprint to how to complete creation and allowed us to do that holy work. I know no one that it did it more wonderfully than Paul Mayer. Above all, he stood for the proposition that we are not the prisoners of a bitter and unremitting past, but rather we can be, we must be, we will be the shapers of a better and more hopeful future for all God's children. Paul loved the idea of the Kaddish precisely because this prayer of memorial does not mention death. It affirms what it means to be alive and affirms God's presence in the world. Join me now, please rise if you can and I know the words are written in transliteration. I'll translate the last line at the end, but for those who know it, please join. For those who don't know it and can read, feel free in this affirmation of God. And for those who can follow along in your own heart, say the prayer that you think most fitting for Paul at this moment. Yitgadal v'yitgadash shemei rabah Bialma divra kirute viam lich malchute, Bechayachon uviamechon vachaye de col bait Yisrael, Ba gala visman kori vimidru, Amen. Yehe shme raba mevorak le olam ol me ol maya, Yit barak viyish tabak viyit paar viyit roman, viyit nase, viyit adar, viyit alel, viyit alal shmeed de kudashar berichu. Leila mincho berkata vishirata, tushpekata vinechemata, da amiram bioma vimiru, amen. Yehe shlomo rabba min shamaya, 
v'chayim alenu v'al kol Yisrael v'miru amen. O se shalom bim romav, hu ya se shalom alenu v'al kol Yisrael v'miru amen. May the one who has spread peace throughout the places on high now spread peace over us, over Israel, over all humankind. And let us say together, Amen. The words of blessing in our tradition is, may Paul Mayer's memory ever be for a blessing. Zichrona livracha, truly, it is a blessing of life for us all. Amen. So please remain standing uh, for our closing song, This Little Light of Mine. Uh, Michael and I are going to bring Paul's ashes through. If you want to touch them, if you want to look at them, uh, we'll do that while the song is going. Also, after the song, the song will conclude this service. There will be a meal, uh, a, a repast, I should say, and we have to move the chairs. So if you're feeling strong, just move the chairs to the side and feel free to set up in whatever shape works for you. Let's sing together. Is this thing back on? Sure. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Everywhere I go, everywhere I go, I'm gonna let it shine. Everywhere I go, I'm gonna let it shine. Everywhere I go, I'm gonna let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Out in the dark, out in the dark, I'm gonna let it shine. Let's do one living for peace and justice. Living for peace and justice. I'm gonna let it shine. Living for peace and justice. Living for peace and justice. I'm gonna let it shine. Living for peace and justice.